Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for your patience. This is Sarah Zakaria. I'm the Associate Director of Alumni Relations at the USD, and I'm excited to have you join us for today for our Young Alumni Network webinar, How to Purchase Your First Home, with our presenter, Michael Graves. First, I'd like to thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to join us this afternoon. Before we begin, um, we will uh, have a, a few more reminders. Today's webinar is being recorded. Access to the replay of this webinar will be found on the USD alumni website about one week from today. So if you need to step away from the webinar and are interested in reviewing it at a later time, the archive broadcast will be posted to the USD alumni website. On your screen is a control panel with a chat area where you're able to ask questions. Questions are very welcomed and Mike is looking forward to hearing what you have to say. So please submit your questions and we will answer as many as time allows. If you experience technical difficulties, please submit concerns via the chat area. In the event that we all experience technical difficulties during today's webinar, we will attempt to resolve the issue as soon as possible, just like we did earlier. <laughs> um, however, if we're unable to do so, we will re reschedule the session and an email with the new date and time will be sent. I don't think that will be necessary today. Without further ado, I would like to introduce today's presenter. Michael Graves began his mortgage lending career in Seattle, Washington after graduating from Whitman College. He moved to Fort Lauderdale, Florida and then later to Woodbridge, New Jersey and finally landed in San Diego, his hometown since 1989. Michael is passionate about providing his customers with superior financial advice and understands how to structure loans that meet his borrower's goals. Having lived across the country, and experiencing countless real estate and lending cycles, Michael is able to provide exceptional mortgage lending guidance. Residential Wholesale Mortgage Inc., a direct lender, is a strong community mortgage lender since 1994 and supports Michael in his endeavors to provide the best programs and services to his clients. Michael presents the first time home buyer workshop hosted by the USD Burnham Moores Center for Real Estate annually. He also frequently attends recruitment events at USD and hires USD interns. Welcome, Mike. We now turn the time over, for, over to you. Sarah, thank you for the introduction and welcome everyone to today's webinar. So for the next 30 minutes or so, we're going to discuss the mortgage financing process as it relates to purchasing your first home. I want to give you a brief overview of the topics we're going to be discussing here. We're going to, those are going to include the mortgage pre-approval process. We're going to talk about credit reports. We're going to talk about various different types of mortgage financing, give you an overview of the loan qualifying criteria, We'll talk about down payment and the source of funds available for down payment. Also talk about closing costs and distinguish different types of closing costs. And we'll also talk about mortgage insurance. When is it required and what does it cost? So before we get into those topics, though, let's talk briefly about home ownership. And Sarah, do I control moving the... Uh, Slides, yes, you can use the arrows at the bottom or you can use your uh, computer screen. Very good, good, thank you for that. Okay, so you're considering looking to buy your first home. It's a great, exciting time, opportunity. Certainly, I would counsel you to consider home ownership a long term investment, meaning owning for five years or more. And you also want to take into consideration the cost of maintenance, as the responsibility for repairs and maintenance will be yours as a homeowner. So as compared to being a renter where the landlord's responsible for the repairs and maintenance, those are your responsibility. And as you're considering where to look for a home, you're going to consider the various uh, aspects of the neighborhood. You may take schools into consideration, uh, various other aspects of the neighborhood. And potentially it represents a lifestyle change for you. You may be currently living in an urban environment. You may be moving to a more of a suburban environment. You may have different commuting uh, cost to face. So there's potential lifestyle changes there. Of course, the great benefit or one of the great benefits of a home ownership is you can make the home your own. You paint it the way you like, decorate the way you like, it becomes a true reflection of yourself. So you've decided to own a home. What's next? Well, the current real estate market in San Diego is characterized by a very uh, tight supply and inventory of homes and a lot of demand. That being the case, I think it's critical that a potential buyer get pre-approved with a mortgage lender 
to determine their borrowing capacity before they get too in-depth in looking for a home. You want to know what you can borrow, what's affordable, so that you know which neighborhoods and areas to look in. And selecting your mortgage lender is very important. This person's going to learn all about your financial uh, history and what your goals are. You want to make sure that you find someone that you feel comfortable working with. Different mortgage products have different pros and cons. Some are more suited to a certain type of buyer than others are. And you want a professional mortgage person who knows uh, what you're looking to accomplish and can definitely tailor the mortgage program to best fit your needs. So how to select a lender? Well, certainly referrals from family, friends, colleagues, that's very important. Someone who's already dealt with the professional before can give you a good referral. I would highly recommend you speak with more than one lender. You want to do some comparison to determine who that right person is for you to work with. The next step along the way is getting actually pre-approved. And different lenders offer different options here. I would recommend the pre-approval as compared to the pre-qualification. Pre-approval is much stronger, especially in today's real estate market in San Diego. When your real estate agent makes the offer on the home, he or she is going to want to be able to make the strongest potential offer because you may be competing against other buyers who are interested in that property. And if you have a pre-approval from a lender as compared to a pre-qualification, you'll be in a stronger position on your offer. What are the differences between the two? Well, pre-qualification is basically based off of verbal information that you provide, and usually the lender does not access your credit report. And the most important distinction is the lender does not submit your loan to an actual automated underwriting system. Whereas on the pre-approval process, you'll actually complete a mortgage application. So you've selected a lender that you feel comfortable working with, you've uh, completed the mortgage application, you'll provide income and asset documentation, you'll give the lender authorization to access your credit report, they'll do the analysis of your borrowing capability and actually submit it to one of the two um, uh, government-sponsored enterprises, being Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, they'll submit your loan application to their automated underwriting system and receive an approval. With that, you'll be in a very strong negotiating position for the potential purchase of your home. One aspect of that pre-approval process, in addition to the income and asset documentation that you'll provide, is your credit report. So let's talk a little bit about credit reports. Credit reports used for mortgages can be different than a credit report used for other types of financing. So it can be different than the type of credit accessed for an auto purchase or a credit card because the algorithms used in determining credit history can vary depending on the different types of borrowing that the borrower is applying for. So when it comes to credit reports for mortgages, the range is pretty vast. It can go from a very, very low of 300 to a very high of 900. Generally, credit scores above 720 are considered excellent for mortgage financing. So what are some of the different uh, aspects or what can affect a person's credit score? Well, a person's score can be influenced by the amount of credit a person has and the type of credit. So higher revolving debt as compared to installment debt can sometimes be a negative on a person's credit score, or certainly higher type of interest debt can be a negative as well too. One thing to keep in mind is it is important to show open available credit without high balances. That is a positive for a person's credit score. So for example, if you have a credit card with a $10,000 balance, or excuse me, a $10,000 high limit, and you only have a couple hundred dollar balance on it, that's actually a positive for your credit score because it shows that you have available credit, but you don't tend to max it out. Whereas the reverse works as well, too, is if you have a $10,000 high balance on your credit card or a high limit, excuse me, on your credit card with a $9,000 balance, that tends to work as a negative on a person's credit score because it shows that you tend to max out your credit. Of course, on-time repayment of debt is a major influencer of credit scores and your history of timely payments. The longer you've had credit and made on-time payments, the better it is for your score. You may have heard that uh, too many credit checks can be a negative on a person's credit score. That's true. Don't see that uh, very often. But if someone were shopping around for a lot of different financing at one time, meaning maybe a mortgage loan, an auto loan, opening a number of credit cards in a relatively short period of time, 30 or 60 days, a number of inquiries could have a negative effect. 
but like I say, we don't see that too often. Let's talk a little bit more about credit reports. We actually access three credit bureaus. Uh, we access TransUnion, Equifax, and Experian. Um, and so the mortgage lender is actually going to use the middle score of those three. So for example, if a person's credit score was 740 from one of the bureaus, 720 from another bureau, and then 700, we would actually use that middle credit score for mortgage financing, which would be the 720 number. I frequently get asked the question, is there a minimum credit score that a mortgage lender requires? And the answer is yes, there is. Generally, credit scores need to be 620 or higher. Now, exceptions can be made if there's a unique circumstance where for one reason or another, a borrower is in dispute on a credit item, it's a legitimate excuse, uh, dispute, can be documented, and therefore that's causing the credit score to decline. Uh, changes can, or uh, exceptions can be granted on that. But generally, a lender's looking for a 620 or higher credit score. Some credit do's and don'ts. So the do's are pretty uh, self-explanatory. Do stay current on your existing accounts to maintain your credit. And do consider monitoring your credit periodically just to make sure that there's no you know, uh, activity there that you're not aware of. Some credit don'ts, and some of these may not um, jump out at you right away, but some will. So certainly don't apply for any new credit. So after you've gotten pre-approved for your mortgage loan, the mortgage lender is going to have to have to access your credit report at least one more time prior to the closing, maybe more than that. But don't apply for any new credit as that can negatively affect your scores. And also prior to getting pre-approved for your mortgage loan, if for any reason you have collection accounts or charge-offs, don't pay those off right away. Let the mortgage lender pull your credit report. He or she will counsel you on whether or not to pay off those collections or charge cards. What happens is you may have a collection or charge off from three or four years ago and if you pay it off now it shows as recent activity which can be a negative on your credit report so if those need to be paid off your mortgage person will counsel you on that don't close out any of your credit accounts either because as we were talking earlier having high available credit with a relatively low balance versus your available limit is a benefit for your score and I'm not sure if it's cut off on your page, cut off a little bit on mine. Don't max out or overcharge your credit cards. Okay, we talked about credit. Let's talk about the different types of mortgage financing today. And so there's three general types of mortgage financing. There's FHA financing, which is guaranteed by the federal government. And this is very beneficial for first time home buyers. Some of the benefits, and we'll talk about these in more detail, is it offers lower down payments. There's flexibility as to the source of funds, where the money can come from for the down payment. FHA also is a little more flexible on credit guidelines and also more flexible on qualifying debt ratios when they look at a borrower's total debts as compared to their income. So that's very beneficial, again, for first-time home buyers. VA, if a person is active military or a veteran and they have their VA benefits, this can be very beneficial as well because VA actually offers some opportunities for no down payment uh, whatsoever up to a certain sales price. And I'll explain that in more detail here in a little bit. Also offers some lower closing costs to the veteran, greater credit flexibility similar to FHA, and greater qualifying debt to income ratios also similar to FHA. Conventional financing is very beneficial for the buyer with 20% or more as a down payment as it specifically exempts the requirement for mortgage insurance, whereas FHA and VA require mortgage insurance regardless of the down payment. And so conventional financing can be advantageous for that borrower who has 20% or more as a down payment. Also, when it comes to financing a condominium, sometimes FHA financing can be advantageous there as compared to FHA and VA as well too. So let's talk a little more detail about those mortgage qualifying criteria. So FHA, so as a mortgage lender, we'll look at uh, borrowers, and it may be you know one or two borrowers, multiple borrowers, we'll look at their total gross income, and we'll compare their debts, and so that would include the proposed housing payment on the new home that's being purchased. And when we look at that housing payment on the new home, the lender is going to consider the principal and interest payment, the taxes, the insurance, and if there's any homeowners association dues, because that's the total new housing payment that the borrower is looking to incur with the purchase. 
and then we'll also add in all of the other debts. And in terms of debts, we look at installment payments. So if you have credit cards, if you have student loan, or excuse me, auto loans for installment, if you have student loans, we also take into consideration credit card payments as well too. We don't look at discretionary spending though. So things that aren't pure debt are not considered in the debt ratios. So FHA will allow person total debt, including the new proposed housing payment to go up to 50% of their gross income. And gross again is before deduction for taxes and insurance. One of the other nice features or benefits that FHA allows is they will allow non-occupying co-borrowers. So for example, if parents are going to be uh, co-signing for a child purchasing their first home, which happens frequently, or maybe uh, siblings are co-signing for someone buying or even grandparents, FHA does allow that for qualifying. And they look at everyone's income and everyone's debts together. So if the purchasers don't quite meet that 50% requirement, but for example, the parents can have good income, don't have a lot of debt, and they help get the, guy, uh, the debt ratio down under 50%, FHA allows that. The other nice feature FHA has is there's no post-closing liquidity requirements. So if as a buyer you use all your funds for your down payment and your closing costs, uh, FHA is okay with that. And US citizenship is not required. So if someone's here with a valid work visa or a green card, that's acceptable with FHA guidelines as well too. Let's talk a little bit about VA guidelines. Very similar in some aspects to FHA, again, in terms of allowing the total debt to income ratio to be up to 50%. Uh, VA does have one additional um, income qualifying aspect they look at. They look at a veteran borrower's residual monthly income also to make sure that there's enough left over after meeting the bills. And they have a formula they use depending on the size of the family, whether it's one person, two people, three or four, et cetera. Generally, however, if you meet the 50% guideline, you'll also meet the residual monthly income criteria also. One nice feature of VA is they do allow a zero down payment. And in San Diego County, that can be on a sales price up to 500,000. So a veteran borrower can uh, borrow, they're buying a $450,000 sales price. If they qualify for the payments on that, they can borrow the 450,000, the whole amount for their uh, purchase. In addition to that, VA will allow loan amounts as high as $1 million, but those do require a down payment, a certain percentage down payment once you cross over that $500,000 sales price. VA, similar to FHA, has no post-closing liquidity requirements. So if a person is tight on cash, but can, certainly has good income, VA can be an option if you're an eligible uh, active military or veteran. One aspect on VA though, different than FHA, they do not allow non-occupant co-borrowers. So the occupying borrowers have to be able to qualify for the debt on their own. Jump to conventional financing. And again, as I had mentioned earlier, this can be advantageous if the borrower has at least a 20% down payment because you don't have mortgage insurance. And we'll talk a little bit more about mortgage insurance here in a couple of slides. But uh, conventional financing is a little more restrictive in terms of debt ratios than FHA and VA are in terms of they will, conventional financing will allow that debt ratio to go up to 45% of the borrower's gross monthly income. Now, the exceptions can be made on that with some compensating factors. So it's not hard and fast at the 45, but certainly we need to look at some compensating factors to go over that. And with conventional financing, generally a borrower's credit score needs to be a little higher than FHA and VA will allow. FHA and VA will go down to that 620 credit score. Generally conventional requires 660 or higher. And with your conventional financing, the underwriter will look that you have at least one or two months worth of the new housing mortgage payment in your bank account after you've used the monies for your down payment and closing costs. Again, though, the admin advantage is with the 20% or more down payment, no mortgage insurance. Okay, down payment and closing costs. Let's talk about those. What are the various sources and options for your down payment and your closing costs? FHA uh, requires a minimum of 3.5% of the sales price as the down payment. So whatever sales price you're looking at, you can certainly calculate 3.5% and determine the minimum required down payment. 
the source of funds for this for FHA can be a borrower's own funds, the person who's buying, or it can also be a gift from immediate family member. So for example, if your parents are generous enough to be gifting you for down payment monies, all of the down payment per FHA can come from a gift from immediate family. Immediate family is uh, mother, father, brother, sisters, grandparents. Also, FHA does allow the seller to pay the borrower's closing costs up to 6% of the sales price. And that can include all of your closing costs, including impound accounts for your tax, your property taxes and insurance. And we'll talk a little bit more about what impounds are here as we go along. But good flexibility with FHA in terms of uh, fairly minimum down payment and the source of funds can come from immediate family members. VA uh, offers the option of no down payment, as we had mentioned just a moment ago, up to a maximum sales price of 500000 in San Diego. If the sales price is greater than that, VA does have a formula they require for down payment. So any amount of the sales price over 500000 the veteran buyer has to have 25% of that amount over 500000 as a down payment. So for example, on a $600,000 down payment, that would require a minimum $25,000 down payment, and then VA would provide financing for the remaining $575,000. Uh, also, VA is flexible on the source of funds. It can be the borrower's own funds or also a gift from an immediate family member. A uh, seller can pay the buyer's closing costs, a little less percentage-wise, but generally 4% is going to cover all of the closing costs anyway, so that works. Conventional financing, a little bit different here in that the minimum down payment requirement is 5%. So as you can see, it's a little more down payment requirement than FHA has and certainly more than VA has. There are some options available with as little as a 3% down payment, but there's some restrictions associated with that. So I would recommend if you're interested in exploring that more, you can talk one-on-one -on -one with me about that. Uh, the, here's one important factor to keep in mind when it comes to conventional financing. That minimum down payment, that 5%, has to be the borrower's own funds. So if you're looking at a $300,000 purchase, that 5%, 15000 that has to be a person's own funds. The amount of funds after that for the closing costs or if you're making a larger down payment can be a gift from family, but that initial 5%, excuse me, has to be the borrower's own funds. Again, the seller can pay some of the borrower's closing costs. There's different limits on that. Um, the most restrictive is 3%, but again, with our sales prices in San Diego County, 3% will generally cover all of the buyer's closing costs. So a little overview there of down payment and, and uh, sources of the down payment for FHA, VA, and conventional financing. Let's talk about closing costs. A lot of uh, questions relative to closing costs. I break them into two categories. There's lender fees and there's non-lender fees. So the lender fees are what gets paid to the lender for the services that they're providing. And generally these include the loan processing fee, the underwriting fee, the closing fee, the funding fee. And you will uh, get, once you've signed your purchase contract, you will get a good faith estimate of the fees. And these will, that will specifically tell you what the lender fees are. You can also ask the lender and whoever you choose to work with will provide this to you. If they don't, you should keep shopping for a lender who will. An estimate of the fees that is um, similar to the good faith estimates, just not formally called that. But again, it'll break out the lender fees for you and give you an estimate for the uh, third-party fees. And when comparing lenders as you're shopping around, definitely you want to compare based on fees. So you want to look at rates, you want to look at fees they charge, as well as the service that the lender offers you and the counseling that they provide you. There are certain fees associated with a purchase transaction that are not determined by the lender. These are third-party fees, and they're established by the third parties who provide those services. So for example, the appraisal fee, even though the lender will order the appraisal, the fee is actually set by the third party vendors, although the fees are pretty well established these days. Your credit report fee is also established by the credit reporting company. Again, the lender is going to be able to give you a very good estimate on that. Your title fees, your escrow fees, your recording fees, notary fees, those can vary quite a bit. And, and generally, those are a negotiated item as to what service providers are going to offer those fees or those services to you. That's something you and your real estate agent would negotiate with the seller and the seller's agent. These fees are established by someone other than the lender. 
so I would they're not really the fees you would take into consideration when uh, comparing the lender and selecting them based on the service and the rate and the fees they offer because the lender doesn't control those fees. Let's talk a little bit about impound accounts. What is an impound account? So with certain types of financing, you as the buyer have the option to pay your property taxes when the bills come due and property taxes in San Diego County are paid twice a year. So you would pay every six months worth of property taxes and also have the option to pay your hazard insurance policy every year when that uh, bill comes due. However, other types of financing require that you include that every single month in your mortgage payment. You will pay that one twelfth of those amounts to your mortgage lender. And then when the property tax bill comes due, the lender will actually take from your impound account and pay your property taxes. And every year when your hazard insurance bill comes due, the lender will have collected the amount from you on a monthly basis and pay that to your uh, insurance company. With those loan programs that allow you the option you can certainly choose to have the lender do that. A lot of borrowers do. It makes it easier for them so they don't get that big bill multiple times throughout the year, twice a year for insurance, or excuse me, for taxes, and once a year for insurance. However, some loan programs, so FHA and VA, for example, do require that the borrower have an impound account. So regardless of the amount of down payment, you will have to have an impound account every month to pay your property taxes and insurance with FHA and VA. Conventional loans give the borrower the option provided there's at least a 10% or more down payment. And again, if you do not have the impound account, you would be responsible for paying those property tax bills and hazard insurance when they come due. Per diem interest. I get questions on per diem interest frequently. And it's a good question because per diem mortgage interest is definitely different than uh, paying rent. So mortgage payments are always made in arrears. For example, if a borrower makes their May mortgage payment, they're actually paying the interest for the month of April. So as compared to renting, when you make your payment in May, you're paying rent for the upcoming month, meaning the month of May, your mortgage payments are actually paid in arrears. So the lender is charging you interest in April, you pay for that in May. So when you close your loan on any given date, you're going to have per diem interest from the day of closing until the end of the month. So I just, for our example here, it shows May 22nd. If a loan were closing on May 22nd, there'd be 10 days of per diem interest because you also count the 22nd itself. May has 31 days. We've got 10 days of per diem interest. And the first mortgage payment would be due July 1st, which covers the interest due for the month of June. So there's always there's people who have this concept that you skip a month's worth of mortgage payment. In a sense, yes, because with purchasing, you won't have your rent payment due, say, in this example on June, your mortgage payment will come July 1st, but keep in mind it is in arrears, so you are paying the interest for the month of June. Get questions on that, so I thought it'd be worthwhile to talk about that. Mortgage insurance, let's get into this. So again, FHA and VA do require mortgage insurance. It can be fairly expensive, but again, there's you know different pros and cons for the different types of financing. So when you're working with your mortgage professional, you want to make sure that they're really examining all the different options and figure out the ones or two or three that make the most sense for you. Of course, you're going to decide you're the consumer. You want to make sure that you're selecting something that fits for your best goals, but your mortgage lender should lay out your options for you. So what is mortgage insurance? Why do I need it? And what does it cost? Well, mortgage insurance provides insurance coverage to the lender if the borrower defaults on the loan. So on certain minimum down payment loans, again, all FHA, all VA loans, there's higher risk to the lender because the borrower has less of a down payment. And so mortgage insurance is a requirement. Um, also on conventional loans, if a borrower has less than a 20% down payment, there is mortgage insurance required. But as long as the borrower has a 20% or more down payment on a conventional loan, then mortgage insurance is not required. I gave you an example here on an FHA loan of what the mortgage insurance would look like. So for example, on a, and there's two types of mortgage insurance with FHA. There's an upfront premium, which can be financed, and then there's a monthly amount. So for example, with a sales price of $400,000, that minimum 3.5% down payment would be a $14,000 down payment. And again, that source of funds can be a gift from a family member. The base loan amount would be 386,000. 
the upfront portion of the mortgage insurance to FHA would be 6,755, which can be added into the loan amount. So the borrower doesn't have to come up with cash for that, but it could be added into the loan amount. And then there is a monthly mortgage insurance charge, which would run $521 a month. So that's something to keep in mind as you're exploring your different financing options. Again, which one really provides the best option and fits your needs the best. Continuing on with mortgage insurance, VA uh, still has a type of cost associated with that's similar to mortgage insurance. It's definitely much less than FHA is. It is a one-time funding fee that can be added into the loan amount based on uh, certain parameters as to maximum loan amounts. And it can vary from 0% up to 3.15%. So a little bit harder for me to give an example on that. Uh, but certainly a veteran borrower, if they had questions, their lender would be able to help them determine that. And again, that's offering a less expensive cost to the veteran borrower or the active military borrower and still has some low down payment options available. Conventional financing, as I mentioned, requires at least that, uh, requires mortgage insurance with at least that 20% or less than 20% down payment, 20% or more, no mortgage insurance. And with the conventional loan, a borrower does have the option to request that the mortgage insurance be dropped after at least a two year period, it does require mortgage payments be made on time throughout that time period. And the borrower would have to document that they now had a 20% or greater equity position. So that would require a new appraisal on the property to document maybe appreciation or principal pay down, show what the current value is. And if there's that 20% equity position, the buyer can request that the mortgage insurance be dropped. Whereas that's different with FHA and VA, no opportunity to drop that other than refinancing if you've got the higher equity position. I wanted to share a mortgage amortization with all of you. With interest rates being as low as they are, and I think this is part of the compelling reason why so many people are out in the marketplace looking to buy, is it's a great way to build up equity and almost a savings program in and of itself. So what I've shown here is an example of a 360,350 loan and an interest rate of 3.75%, a 30 year fixed rate. The principal and interest portion of the payment is $1,668.84. So could be less than what you're paying in rent. Keep in mind that um, uh, you do have taxes and insurance in addition to that. So that's not the only part of the payment. But what I wanted to show you here was the breakdown between the interest portion and the principal portion. So approximately a third of that principal and interest payment is going to reduce your principal right from day one, the very first mortgage payment. And then over time, the amount associated with the principal will continue to increase as you make more payments and the principal balance pays down. That's one of the big compelling reasons why so many people are opting for purchasing these days. Okay, that's the pre-approval process. Some of the basics in terms of qualifying, down payment, what are closing costs, what's mortgage insurance. So what is the mortgage process once you've signed a purchase contract? You've gotten pre-approved, you're working with your real estate agent, you make an offer on a home, your offer is accepted, now you're ready to finalize your mortgage. So at that point, your lender will ask you most likely to update your income and asset documentation. Depending on how long it's been since your pre-approval was done, the lender may have to update your credit report as well too. You'll be provided the formal good faith estimate of closing costs for your review. Your lender will dialogue with you. Do you want impounds for taxes and insurance if that's an option available to you? You'll get significant loan disclosures uh, providing you all of the detail relative to the type of loan program. And those loan disclosures, that's a very important timing wise. You want to review those right away. If you have questions, certainly dialogue with your lender, sign those, get them back to the lender right away. That way they can order the appraisal, get the process moving forward in terms of evaluating the value of the property. And if you're purchasing a condominium, the lender is going to need some condominium documentation from the homeowners association such as the budget, the bylaws, et cetera, in addition to the appraisal. You'll obtain your final loan approval from your lender. They will coordinate with the escrow company, scheduling the closing. 
Escrow is the third party that collects all of the documents from the lender, documents from the buyer, documents from the seller, and they will actually be responsible for dispersing funds and coordinating the recording of the transaction. You'll sign your closing documents with the escrow company or their mobile notary. You'll transfer your funds to escrow. The lender will transfer their funds, complete the purchase, and you are now a homeowner. Congratulations. Thought we'd talk briefly here, and we're almost to the end, then we can open it up for questions. Thought we'd talk briefly about selecting a real estate agent. You may already have an agent that you work with. Certainly similar to considering mortgage lender, you want to talk to family and friends, colleagues about referrals. I would recommend you speak with definitely more than one agent, because again, this is someone you're going to work closely with. And I would highly recommend you specialize, or you work with someone who specializes in the particular or specific neighborhoods you're looking at. A lot of valuable information they can gain or share with you relative to the neighborhood if that's where they specialize and they know it. Viewing properties online can be very educational, and I'm a proponent of visiting open houses on the weekend. Real estate offers uh, open houses on Saturdays and Sundays. It's a great way to get to know the neighborhood, get a feel for what you like, what you don't like. I think that's a valuable exercise. What's happening in the San Diego real estate market? You're probably well aware of this, but as I mentioned earlier, it is characterized by a lack of inventory right now and certainly high demand. So what does this mean to you as a, as a home buyer? More than likely, there's gonna be multiple offers on the properties. That's very much the current norm today in this cycle. So again, having the strongest offer possible, including a pre-approval is to your benefit. Homes are selling relatively quickly. And again, that pre-approval important for your process. I'd also say know what you want and what you can trade off. You may have a certain market area that you're looking in. You may have to expand your search criteria, look in a little bit greater area, or you may have certain features that you can trade off. Maybe you're looking in an urban area. You'd like to have a garage, but some of the other features are more important to you. You're willing to trade no garage, have uh, street parking, for some of the other features that you could get in the home. So be flexible in terms of, and know what you want, what are the criteria that are important to you in the home, what are some that maybe you can make a trade off on. And because there are quite a few buyers in the marketplace, don't get frustrated. You'll find what you're looking for, it's out there. Purchasing your home's a great experience. And as I say here, I think the more knowledge you have, the better your transaction will be, and you'll be able to make great decisions. Certainly, if you uh, wanted to do a one-on-one -on -one counseling with me, every person's situation is unique. I'd be more than happy to work with you. If you want, to, or if you want to get more details on some of the topics we've talked about, or have specific questions relative to mortgage financing, uh, my email address is there. My office address. If you are interested in exploring this more or learning more, feel free to email me or give me a call. I'd be happy to share that or talk about uh, more specifics with you. Sarah, that concludes my presentation. We can open it up to questions if you like. Thank you, Michael. Um, that was a really informative, amazing uh, presentation going over financing um, for uh, purchasing your first home. Um, I'd like to open it up for questions. Um, we have several participants, so please type in your questions and I'll ask Michael about the, uh, them and he'll be able to respond to you right now. We have one person typing in a question right now. <clears throat> so while that person is typing in a question, I have a question for you. Um, so what do you recommend people have in savings um, when they're starting to look for a house? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, depending on your price range, um, you want to have anywhere from that 3 to 5%. Um, 
because first time home buyers, a lot of those loan programs will allow that minimum down payment. That being said though, if you have the ability to get a gift from a family member, or again, if you've got your VA eligibility because you're active military, it can be as little as zero. And if you're not active military, but your family members are willing to give you a gift to help you start out with this first time home purchase, uh, you can have no money and it can all be gift funds. Oh, wonderful. I have another question from an, uh, an alum. Uh, when can I remove mortgage insurance from my monthly bill on an FHA loan? Yeah, great question. So previously, FHA had a policy where after uh, two years, just like conventional, you, the uh, borrower or homeowner could petition to have the mortgage insurance drop. FHA has recently changed their policy on that to where at this point in time, you cannot drop the mortgage insurance on an FHA transaction, or you cannot petition to have it dropped. So then what you have to do, your option is to refinance into a conventional loan, provided you have that 20% equity position, because a conventional loan will not then require the mortgage insurance. Great, thank you so much for that review. I have another question. Is it worth shopping around for mortgages and lenders as well as real estate agents? Yeah, very much so, absolutely. Yeah, I definitely shop around. Talk to multiple people. You wanna find someone who's knowledgeable, who's going to work with you to help tailor that financing to bet fit your needs. You definitely also wanna shop around in terms of rates for the lender's fees. So I would tell you those three aspects, service, rates, lender fees, that's what you wanted to consider when you're looking at different lenders and very definitely shop around. Great, and we have time for another question and we have someone typing something in right now. Okay. But thank you so much for these, um, for these uh, answers, sorry. Sure, no problem, happy to do so. And like I say, if anyone wanted to do a uh, separate call with me or talk about their unique situation, I'm more than happy to do so. Um, so I have a question from another person. It says, um, I'm in the process of finding my first home. Can you talk about the importance of selecting an agent that is well established in the San Diego community? Yeah, I think that's a great question and that's really critical. Some real estate agents will tell you they can represent you anywhere in San Diego County. And technically, yes, they can. But I would strongly tell you that you wanna work with an agent who specializes in a particular market. So just to use an example, let's say you're looking in the North Park, South Park area. You want an agent who really knows those market areas, who knows the different streets, who understands what's been happening in the market, the dynamic changes that are taking place, maybe new buildings that are coming in, what are the schools like, et cetera, so that they can really give you a lot of good inside information. If you're looking to buy an Escondido, you want to work with an agent who's been in that market for a while, who really knows that area. So I think that's critical to work with an agent who specializes in the particular neighborhood that you're looking at. Great, thank you so much. And thank you alumni for participating and for also um, asking some questions. Um, I'm gonna just forward to our next slide as we close. Um, I want to again thank our presenter, Mike Graves and the Young Alumni Network uh, programming team. I wanna also invite you all to register for the, uh, the next webinar that we have, Money, Negotiating What's Yours. It's a salary negotiation webinar, so we all can do that. We all, you know, either can use it ourselves or, um, you know, have a friend that could, you know, use the advice. Um, I also wanted to let you all know um, that the USD Wine Class is a client, blah, blah, blah. USC Wine Classic is coming up and there will be a special Young Alumni Wine Education pre-event um, directly before the main event starting at 1.30. Um, so I look forward to seeing you all soon and I hope, I wish you all a happy house hunting. I also wanted to let you know that the recording of this webinar and the PowerPoint slides will be posted on the USD alumni website one week from today. Thank you again and have a great day.